when you look at this movie, what do you see? You might see a forgotten kids movie from the mid-aughts. You might see a favorite punching bag for cartoon reviewers over the years. You might see just a cheap throwaway flick. What do I see? Well, <laughs> it's a long, long story. Paris, early 1960s. Like any other monument, the Eiffel Tower needed renovations. And like any other renovation, accidents can happen. A worker named Serge Dano was injured on the job. As he recuperated at home, he needed something to do. And so, he began to experiment with animation. Over the next few years, he created short films in his apartment and found he had a knack for it. Dano was hired to shoot commercials for a studio called La Comète. There he met animator Ivor Wood, who would be his collaborator in an unexpectedly massive project. Again, returning to Serge's apartment, they filmed the pilot episode for a new series. The series would feature a human child named Margot, a jack-in-the-box named Zebulon, a rabbit named Flappy, a cow named Azala, a snail named Embrus, and a sugar-craving terrier dog named Palu. The newly reorganized French radio and television broadcasting office ordered 13 five-minute episodes of this new series called The Manège Enchanté. The series was instantly a success, popular enough to spawn merchandise like toys and t-shirts, with the most merchandisable character proving to be Paulo, the cute little dog. Shocking to hear, I know. By 1966, they had made over 250 five-minute episodes of the program, but things really kicked into high gear when the series leapt across the channel to Britain. The BBC was interested in airing this very popular and merchandisable program, but felt that it would be too difficult to translate into English. They got around this problem by simply not translating it. Instead, Eric Thompson, father of Emma Thompson, came up with his own original scripts loosely based around the visuals and redubbed the voices himself. These new scripts would of course be bound by the visuals, but in other ways would differ dramatically from the original stories of the episodes. In a sense, it became an almost entirely new show. Margot was transformed into Florence, Zebulon into Zebedee, Flappy into Dylan. Azala into Ermintrude, Ambrose into Brian, yes, Brian, and Paulu was renamed into Dougal, which you'll notice is spelled with a U because British. Finally, the series as a whole was retitled to The Magic Roundabout. Given the five minute long runtimes, these plots had to remain simple. Dougal wants to film a movie but has trouble getting things to run smoothly. A hole has appeared in the ground and the kids try to build a bridge over it. Dougal squabbles with a cannon in his antique shop that he suddenly owns now. The pots and pans go on strike. And all of this was embellished with Eric Thompson's own humor. We've got a lot to do and you're late. If you were in a union, I'd sack you. The dubbed episodes aired on BBC in the transition period between children's programming and the evening news. The bright, colorful characters proved to be a hit with kids, and the dry, snarky humor proved to be a hit with adults. When the BBC moved the program earlier in the day to appeal more to the kids' demographic, they were flooded with angry letters. Pay freeze, 50-pound travel allowance, high taxes, and now you've altered the time of the magic roundabout. What else are we children over 30 going to be deprived of? What about the millions of older children who only finish work at around 5 o'clock and rush home from their offices and factories? This program is just as popular with adults, most of whom don't get home until 5.30. Yours, in anticipation, 26 office clerks. We beg you to reconsider and return the magic roundabout to its original time. Yours faithfully, a hundred angry draftsmen. Average age, 23. The BBC responded, and the programme is now back to its former time of a quarter to six. The Magic Roundabout was a sensation. In 1969, Serge Dano opened his own studio to produce his films, the aptly named Dano Films, focused on making more episodes of his hit series. He also made a feature-length adaptation in 1970 called Palou et le Chat Bleu, again dubbed into English by Eric Thompson to become Dougal and the Blue Cat. The movie pits the residents of the Magic Garden against the evil cat Buxton, who teams up with Madame Blue in a crusade to turn everything into the color blue and imprison all the non-blue people. 
The film managed to expand the concept of the show into a feature-length production pretty well, raising the stakes in a way that still captured the surreal and silly tone of the series. <laughs> oh, I'm so evil. Serge Dano's The Magic Roundabout ended up producing 441 episodes. It was translated into 28 languages and sold to 68 countries around the world, including in the Middle East and Africa. However, all franchises fade. And in the early 1980s, public attention was drifting towards these new cartoons from Japan called anime. Maybe you've heard of it. Dano stopped producing new episodes in 1977. A handful of quote-unquote new episodes were dubbed into English in the early 90s by Nigel Planer, having been lost episodes, but otherwise Dougal and the residents of the Magic Garden seemed to be happily retired. Ivor Wood moved on to new projects like Postman Pat. Eric Thompson passed away in 1982, and Dano passed away in 1990. They left behind a series with a legacy that would resonate with future animators. Peter Lord, co-founder of Ardmain Animation, cites it as one of his big three influences, along with Terry Gilliam and Ray Harryhausen. Serge Dano, with his own two hands, had turned an accident into a golden opportunity, and created something that resonated across multiple generations. Oh, it's in Germany, in Portugal, in, uh, in Canada, in Belgium, Switzerland, uh, uh, well, it's in um, Spain, Italy, and now we're going to, uh, to go to the United States. <laughs> now, does this mean you Americanize it? Will it change? <laughs> Three decades after the Blitz, Bristol had blossomed anew into a cultural hub with creatives coming together to craft bold and exciting art of all kinds. In this thriving community, a new cooperative was established called Crystal Theatre of the Saint, founded by Bradley Winterton and Paul Bassett Davis. Paul had been kicked out of his first year of theatre school, having shown an interest in the more obscure, more surreal, more challenging avant-garde. He and Bradley recruited Mortimer Ribbons to the group put together their first production, and for 10 years brought the experimental theater scene alive, touring to Holland and Germany and London. As time went on, people came and went from the group. One year after the Crystal Theater of the Saint was founded, Paul met David Borthwick, a man who worked running light shows for rock concerts. Borthwick's talents quickly proved valuable, using projections to replace traditional scenery, an economical solution vital for such a small group. His projections made use of photographic slides, sometimes even making them himself. In 1977, Andy Layton came on board in an administrative function for the group. I wonder what else he's been involved in, actually. Oh my god. But sadly, all things must come to an end. And in 1981, the Crystal Theater of the Saint dissolved. But that's not where the group's story ended. Dave Borthwick returned to Bristol University, attending a graduate course at the film department where he met Dave Alex Riddett. Together, the pair received opportunities from the BBC to produce shorts, but given the microscopic budgets handed to them, they decided to be resourceful. In much the same way as Serge Dano started the Magic Roundabout in his own apartment, Borthwick and Riddett scraped together their films without having a proper facility. All they required was our time and imagination. We couldn't afford to commission armatured models, so we plundered local rubbish dumps in the toy cupboards of friends' children. Over time, the ambitions grew, the group grew, and in 1991, the Artist Collective officially incorporated with Dave Borthwick and Dave Alex Riddett as the founders. The name of the studio? Bullock's Brothers. Any creative process still needs money to fuel it. And so Bullock's brothers made ends meet making commercials. And they worked with high-profile brands like Coca-Cola, Budweiser, Reebok, and Lego, often incorporating surreal and borderline horror elements into their work. When partying with your buds, be sure to choose a designated driver. It's the perfect pick-me-up. A message from your friends at Budweiser and O'Doul's. These commercial projects gave them the money they needed to fund passion projects, such as short films. And soon they were ready to take a bigger gamble with a feature-length film an adaptation of a beloved childhood classic. That's right, it's time to talk about 1993's The Secret Adventures of Tom Thumb. 
Orthwick directed, wrote, and edited this film, as well as serving as one of only seven animators on the stop-motion production. This version of the fairy tale focuses on Tom Thumb being separated from his parents by cruel government men, and his attempts to reunite with his father. The film relishes in surreal, strange imagery and a grim storyline, yet successfully instills a strong sense of empathy in its characters. Along the way, we find all kinds of bizarre, monstrous-looking beings that nonetheless we quickly connect to and feel for. It also features Jack the Giant Hunter, who lives outside of the world of big people and actively resents and attacks them, and yet he ultimately still isn't a villain. He's living in a scary world, and he's doing what he thinks he needs to to survive. The film delivers a deliciously twisted version of the fairy tale, featuring unique designs and very effective visual storytelling. Even its live-action elements are filmed and presented in a way that feels like stop-motion in itself, a process called pixelation. Borthwick and the rest of Bullock's brothers demonstrate in The Secret Adventures of Tom Thumb a strong vision, excellent skill, and an ability to take an existing concept and add their own spin on it. It was time to try something even bigger. On June 6, 2001, the studio announced that they had reached a deal to create a new feature film based on the Magic Roundabout. The movie would be an international co-production with the French company Films Action, the rights holders for the series. Notably, the production would employ the new computer animation technology spearheaded by Toy Story. By this point, Andy Layton had just rejoined the group as managing director for the studio. According to him, their story would start in the Magic Garden, but then take the gang on a globe-trotting adventure around the world. He also emphasized that, It is our job to preserve the Magic Roundabout that we know and love. It also offers us a chance to develop the characters a bit more for all ages. In 2002, it was confirmed that Pate would be distributing the film. Pate had previously handled the distribution for Chicken Run, which was, at that time, the highest grossing British animated feature ever. Managing director for Pate Picture, Francois Ivernal, said, The Magic Roundabout holds fond memories for many parents of young children. It is hugely exciting to introduce Dougal and his friends to a new generation. However, not all outlets were so positive. The Irish Independent published, Will anyone even want to watch it? Frankly, it's hard to see where the audience is going to come from. The brand name will mean nothing to the children of today, while nostalgic adults keen to recapture a little bit of their childhood are likely to find the whole thing Disney-fied out of all recognition. Still though, the studio seemed bullish. Executive producer Cameron McCracken said, We have every expectation of doing as well as we did with Chicken Run. Other promotions called it the most anticipated film of the year, and a family classic for years to come. And here's where information... vanishes. It was confirmed in 2002 that David Borthwick would be directing the film, but two more directors are ultimately credited. Frank Passingham was also involved with The Secret Adventures of Tom Thumb as the second unit director. Jean Duval was a layout and storyboard artist for Walt Disney Animation France for six years, working on DuckTales the Movie, Darkwing Duck, and Tailspin. Now let's look at the script, where we find a familiar name credited, Paul B. Davis. But there's also Ralph and Stefan Sanusi. And these two are ghosts. This is the only credit they seem to have ever had. Meanwhile, additional material is credited to Tad Safran. Safran has a bit more reliable information about him. According to IMDb, Tad grew up in England. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. He was a journalist and had a weekly column in the Times of London. He worked in advertising before becoming a writer. His writing has included a movie called The Long Weekend in 2005, one episode of a 2018 series called Life Sentence, a 2021 podcast series called The Lamb, a 2022 book co-written with James Patterson called The 12 Topsy-Turvy Very Messy Days of Christmas, and a 2007 column in Times of London where he complained that British women weren't spending 1700 a month on beauty products like he believed American women were. UK girls, in my opinion, are the greatest natural beauties in the world when they're 17 or 18 years old. Oh, okay, well, I was not expecting it to in that direction. At dinner, I found myself sitting opposite something that surely would have been happier hunting for truffles in the forests of France or grazing on the grassy marshlands of Canada. That. Okay. It's not entirely Sophie's fault, I suppose. My friend's wife didn't manage my expectations. Maybe it would have been better if she had said, Tad, you enjoyed The Lord of the Rings. Would you like to meet an orc? <laughs> Jean-Pierre Carrasso is also credited as adaptation by 
but the full extent of that involvement is unclear, especially since his credit is removed from later versions of the film? Who are these people? Why are there three directors credited? And while I'm at it, what are these other entities listed, like SPZ Entertainment and Canal Plus? It's always weird how these random movies have like a dozen production companies listed. Know what? Maybe the behind the scenes featurettes will have answers. The Magic Roundabout is an all action animated adventure for all the family. Uh, nothing. That's the thing with these featurettes. They can be powerful inspiration for young filmmakers to be, but they can also be used as advertising in themselves. It's in the studio's interests, after all, to make the process seem easygoing, that everyone got along, but it can sand over important details, the reality of the process. Besides, none of the directors and writers even make an appearance here. I have so many questions about this production. If only I could talk with somebody who knew more. Hi, I'm Paul Bassett Davis. I'm a writer. Uh, I was be credited uh, with the screenplay of the movie adaptation of The Magic Roundabout. I began my career pretty much in theatre, and then from there, my next step, that evolved into a punk band, which lasted for a couple of years. And then I began writing comedy material for radio and television for the last few years have been mostly novels and stories. The Magic Roundabout job was, I think that is my only credited produced feature film. It, it was Pate UK that were the prime producers. Somebody somewhere thought because we were beginning to live in a, in a media landscape where children's cartoon IP in general was being seized upon and everyone was saying, oh, we should make a film out of this. This should be a feature film. It was the first feature animation that any of the people involved, I think, certainly the companies involved had done. Because action films were a, a small independent and Bolex Brothers were a, a small independent studio in Bristol. And whoever was involved in this process, and it may have been, it might be worth talking to Andy later or certainly email him. I can give you a contact if you want. My name's Andy Layton, um, and I used to be managed director of Bolex Brothers. I decamped from London. I'm a Londoner originally, and I decamped when I'm done with it, about at the age of 27. And, and I moved, moved to Bristol. The next thing I know, Paul Davis is knocking on my door. Please, 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 we, look, we need an administrator for the Crystal Theatre of the same. The Arts Council wants to give us money, but we haven't got an administrator. And then I looked at Bolex Brothers, the, 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 the work from the commercials, the financial income was drying up. And I thought, well, the best thing to do is, is to build this feature film slate. Um, and, that, and that's what I started to do. Um, Bruce Hyam, he had a link with Kodak and he had a friend um, called Nick Collinson. He worked for Canal Plus. This is, we're back, back to France now, where the Magic Roundabout started. Pathé were the main, one of the big um, French big hitters in, in terms of films and, and finance and, yeah. that, and that's how it came through. So Nick Collinson mentioned it to Bruce. Bruce mentioned it to us. And now I'm into uh, the terrorism when it started. Um, so the two producers, the French producers, were um, uh, oh, Pascal Rodin and his brother, I forgot his name. Uh, Laurent Rodin? Their father, Jean-Marie Rodin, he had a couple of small cinemas in, in, in Paris. Sons of uh, Jean-Marie Rodin had acquired the rights through um, the Dano family to do the magic roundabout. The Rodin brothers needed us because they hadn't done any movies before. Um, and they needed somebody to do the storyboard and, uh, and, and the script. They recognised what a huge hit, or what a huge thing it was in the UK. And so they were looking for a UK partner. And the next thing I know, I'm having meetings with Pathé in the UK. So can you tell me about how the animation style was chosen? One son was very much into uh, animation, but CGI animation in the UK. We were, as you see, stop motion or, or, or 2D. Paris, uh, France, were kind of the leaders because they had about three or four universities that were teaching 
CGI. They were more advanced than we were in Europe. Bolex Brothers' reputation, all these awards we've won at uh, film festivals and, and all that, um, and also being in Bristol-based, I um, have to say this about Bristol, but it's just a one, it is the animation capital of, of the UK. I hope it stays that way. And it could probably only happen in Bristol. There's no real uh, rivalry. We're all part of one community here. So a lot of people who started at Bolex Brothers and went on to Ardman's and a lot of people who went to Ardman's came to Bolex. It, it's all, it's just a wonderful thing. I bump into, uh, I don't know, Sproxton is the other guy, one of the other other bosses of um, of Ardman's and we're walking along the thing. He recognises me. He said, how did you get the, the magic roundabout thing going? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's it but we're all very friendly <laughs> oh that's great um uh can you tell me more about how the funding for the movie came together i had to look around for money and jill i'm going to rocky horror now is that right did you want that one yeah i'd be interested to hear more about like that connection there because i think that'd be so fascinating i think my viewers would be interested in knowing that connection bolex were in trouble um or need more finance i got in touch with jill hey we've got magic roundabout going we've got other movies on the slate and she jumped in and he had connections with jill sinclair who was married to the producer trevor horn uh trevor horn the same trevor horn who did video killed the radio star and he knew trevor horn and he also knew jill sinclair's brother who was a record producer called john sinclair trevor was kind of involved from the get-go with Magic Roundabout, but certainly by the end of it, it became a vehicle for a lot of bubblegum records to which Trevor Horn owned the publishing rights. And I am the music publisher of the Rocky Horror Show because Richard O'Brien is an old, old friend of mine. And uh, John Sinclair, I met him through John Sinclair, Jill's brother. And, um, and, and this goes back to Psalm Studios. You ask about SPZ. Well, I know what SP stands for, that's Sound Productions, and Z, I, I can't remember, probably do, to do with ZTT. If you try and trace the financial paper trail behind Magic Roundabout, and it was quite, it's a big, you know, it's a, it's a feature length animation, which costs money, whichever way you do it. Yeah. So it was a, quite a high budget. Somewhere in there, there's a major factor where, uh, where Trevor Horn gets music in it to which he has the publishing rights. And good luck to him, that's what happens. That's, there, are, there are stranger ways that movies get financed. Somebody's got to pay for it and somebody pays for it wants things to go a certain way. I don't know if you've heard of Robbie Williams, but he was like the, the Justin Bebo of the day. And Kylie Minogue was the Taylor Swift of the day. And, I, and that was my cast list. I'll, 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 I'll say myself, I did the casting with that. And, <laughs> And my big disappointment was they couldn't get the music together. I think because Trevor, it landed again, landed in Trevor Horn's lap, but he had other, he was still producing other things. Anyway. Can you tell me more about Eric Thompson's Magic Roundabout and the impact that had on British culture? For a generation of, of students who thought it was very good fun to watch it because of the kind of nuance he brought to the voice, to the voices he did and the, and the English overdubs he did, made it very British. But it was all very laid back and it was, as I say, slightly ironic tone. And it was a kind of stoner. It was a, it was a, there was a very appealing stoner vibe or perceived by that section of people. So there was a kind of legend that, that uh, you know, students, college students, university students, you know, teenagers would kind of get high and watch this and think it was very funny because it was. You know, from the, from the kiddie show, because it's Bolex, it went slightly darker because that's what we do. And Dave Bothick puts it out to certain designers and, and we look at the script that Paul's done. We wanted to take it away from the garden where all the kiddies um, stuff worked and, and, and take it around the world. And blah, 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 blah. Can you tell me more about uh, Raph and Stefan Sanusi and their role in this production? The Sanusi brothers made an attempt to write, uh, someone had said to them, you know, let's turn, turn this into a feature film. Can you write a, a magic roundabout? Manège en Chanté feature film. And because they had, they didn't have any real experience of, of, of longer form narrative, the script, the first script they came up with was, was pretty much, if you looked at it, a, a collection of these three to five minute episodes or, but that was the dynamic. 
they didn't really have a sense of um, not necessarily that we get hang up on you know three act structure or, or anything like that but they didn't really have a, a kind of sensibility that would see uh, things in terms of a, of a 60 to 70 minute narrative arc and the reason I got hired and brought in was for narrative because that's my you know storytelling that's my my thing Paul was the one of the key members of Crystal Theatre of the Saint. If you like, he was our writer in residence at the Bovex Brothers Crystal Theatre. So it's, it's actually absolutely normal to go to him if a script comes in and see what he can do. And that's how my relationship began with the Sanusi Brothers, which ended up with, in a certain amount of bad feeling, which I very much regret and is mostly my fault. Uh, it was it was kind of sad because we did get on really well. And when I first went over to France, the first few times went to Paris for a week at a time or a few days at a time and worked with them. We had a great creative vibe and it was nice. And they were nice guys, nice young guys. They were good, you know, had good, very creative people. And at a certain point in the process of me trying to um, help the Sanusi brothers develop a, a, a more, a longer form narrative, and we were getting asked to do things like uh, create a background story, a, a backstory, a kind of legend. Um, I, I then began to contribute those sort of things. And because the Zenusis, quite rightly, that wasn't their thing. Suddenly saying, oh, well, let's, let's create an origin story for the character of, of uh, Zebedee. We created a character called Zebadi. And I, I also introduced a character that's not in any of the original things uh, called uh, Soldier Sam, I think, who was, uh, ended up being voiced yeah. by the British actor Ray Winston. What was happening, my, uh, this is my perspective on it, nobody ever really took the decision to say, look, are we just going to make this a kid's film? Are we going to keep the, the, the main thrust of it being what it always was, which was a, a kid's film? Or are we going to acknowledge that it had this kind of appeal to adults because they were doing a lot of animations that were around at that time that attempted to to kind of hit two demographics to, to put things that would appeal to adults as well as kids in there or not not in, in a kind of adult humor but just a more sophisticated or ironic or or, or knowing level to the to the humor i really liked working with the sanusi brothers but the producers uh, particularly the american guy at Cathay uk who sad saffron was certainly the kind of american producer in, 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 on board and the producers or, or the people in, in charge of the purse strings kind of said to me at a certain point, look, I, why not, why, just write a draft of the script. The Sinusis, you know, and I was, I, I did have a kind of crisis of conscience, which if, if I'd been really sincere about, I would have probably said, no, we, we need to, you know, out of ethically, it's the Sinusis baby. Uh, I need to be continuing my role as kind of midwifing. <laughs> However, it's that's easy to think about in retrospect. At the time, it was like, yeah, because they, they were going to commission me to write a whole other draft of the script. And I ended up writing about probably three complete drafts before they brought in some other people to polish, to, to a polish on it. But I was, it, it was me, that I worked for quite a long time going over to France and back thrashing out the structure the narrative structure of the of the, of the script okay. and ending up as i say with something that the producers said yeah we, we we want that and the sanusi brothers objected to because it wasn't their vision it wasn't their work and i think we all to a certain extent got chewed up by a large budget production which I, which wasn't great but it did the job and there were a certain number of jobs which needed doing um, and they were all to do with narrative coherence and long form narrative structure that simply wasn't there from the, in the episodic draft or drafts that the Zenesis were, were coming up with. And I wish I hadn't ended up in a sense being part of who they perceived as being the, the enemy or the, the desecrators. I regret that, that that kind of bad karma on, that, that I ended up at log, not at loggerheads with, but the Zenesis felt um, Badly done by, badly treated. There's a real weird credit on this. I don't know. I don't get. I'm not. I, I try and. IMDb is so notoriously inaccurate. Everyone complains about it because and it takes a huge amount of effort to correct errors in your IMDb credits. 
but certainly on the screen, it was a weird series of credits which said, created by Serge Leno, I think, then written by Ralph and Stephen Zanussi, and then screenplay by Paul B. Davis. And then I don't even know where, yeah, Jean-Pierre, he was just one of the French producers. I hmm. don't know where, where the adaptation, and just people wanted to, essentially, the, uh, <laughs> it ended up the Pate UK and the, all the other producers who ended up on board with this thing had to do a certain amount of mollifying to various parties. And the best way they came up with to mollify them was to give people a credit. And gradually, over the course of a year, they became disillusioned and they became hostile towards me, probably with reason, because as a kind of representative of everything that was coming in and, and taking their project away from them. And that's the result of when suddenly the budget goes into the millions and millions. People get their own stuff taken away from them. And I also wanted to ask about Frank Passingham and Jean Duval, uh, their roles in directing the movie. Frank, oh. Frank would have been overseeing the storyboard and the script and getting on that. And that was good. And that was our part ended, really. The storyboard is where it all, all happens, you know, not so much for live movies, but for animation. That's the key. And, and Dave Borthwick is an, a master at that. I was very close with Dave Borthwick. He was a very good friend of mine. We did a bunch of things together. He was an extraordinary animator. Uh, he was an animator of genius, to be honest with you. To, to, he was a real genius. Uh, Dave Borthwick, who was who was getting was going through a personal crisis during the pre-production and ended up being being kind of sidelined at a certain point they they lost they got they lost confidence in Dave the producers as i say he was going through a very hard time and gently mm. tactfully brought in um Frank mostly that's who Frank passing him Frank took over thank goodness that's the best thing about Bristol that all all the whatever crew directors you know producers whatever they're, they're just around the corner in Bristol David actually kind of taught Frank because a lot of the people and a lot of the people at um, Ardman Animation, you know, people like Vic Park and all the all the animators at Ardman, a lot of them had been students of, of Dave Borthwick's. He was the great pioneer of stop frame animation in the UK, very unacknowledged. He had a great, um, he was one of the fathers of stop frame animation. And you can see how inspired he was as a, as a creator when you watch. The Secret Adventures of Tom Thumb, which is Dave Borthwick's feature film. I'm glad you've seen that film, and I, I think everyone, I wish more people would see it and had seen it. Um, it's an amazing piece of work, and it, if you think about the mind that produced that, um, you can imagine how interesting it was to, to work with Dave. And I was also wondering, is that also when Jean Duval came on board? Jean Duval? Um, no, he would have been the, the French-appointed... Um, Probably it was when we moved it all down to Marseille, and then he would have been the director for the CGI stuff. And there are a hundred reasons why a movie doesn't get made. There are a hundred reasons why it doesn't turn out the way people wanted it to turn out. It's a flop rather than a success. It was quite a steep learning curve for me because it was by it was certainly the most the biggest budget project I'd been involved in, as I said, was a feature film. Once you're over the 10 million bucks mark, which this was, as far as I know, pretty well over. You, you know, you got you got people with serious money. They're going to have they're going to want to have a serious say in the way this develops. When there's 30 million bucks of anybody's money involved, it's no longer playtime at preschool. And I'm full of admiration of, of, for filmmakers, whoever they are, who have succeeded in negotiating that complex and sometimes conflicted uh, world and managed to maintain their integrity, come up with a good product, but even the best of them sometimes screw it up. It's what it is, and it was quite a strange animal, I've got to say. It's kind of a hybrid in many respects. It was all just this little nice kids film. It was all very cute, but there was $30 million of somebody's money arguing behind it, you know? But if you want to see, watch Magic Roundabout, and you've got a six-year-old kid, Take them along and they'll enjoy it. My son, who was six years old at the time when the, when the movie was released, I took him and his friends to the premiere and they thought it was great. There was a bunch of free chocolate. <laughs> they thought yeah. it, was cool. <laughs> it really worked for them and they thought it was fantastic. But they were six, you know. Yeah, Go with know. the six-year-old kid and they'll like it. 
and you sneak out and have a drink while they're watching. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere along the way, I learned that let the spirit rule the material. And unfortunately, you meet <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of greedy people on the way and who don't believe in that. And uh, I'll just say some people don't believe in let the spirit rule the material. They'd, they'd rather get their names up the top. <laughs> anyway, I don't care about that. As a producer or whatever, that's the shit I have to put up with. And you have to uh, have to go through it. Yeah. My main interest was, was keeping Bolex Brothers going. And, and sometimes when you get desperate, you have to look for partners, whatever. And if, if they screw you over, blah, 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 who cares? Um, I did my best. The film opens with Zebedee encountering the aforementioned Zebad, an evil spring puppet with ice powers. Already this instills a far deeper sense of peril than any previous iteration of the Magic Roundabout. But it's alright, it's just a bad dream. We're freshly introduced to the world of the Magic Roundabout to the tune of... Oh. We meet all the main cast of characters anew to the tune of another song. Girl, you really got me going. Among them is Dougal, who sets a pin on the ground to pop the tire on Mr. Grimsdale's candy cart and get it for himself. In doing so, though, he makes it accidentally roll into the town square and cause chaos. <laughs> This sparks a very strange reaction from the roundabout itself. <laughs> Zebedee arrives to assess the situation. He gives the group a map and a magic box of tricks, telling them that they must find and secure three diamonds to contain Zebat again. One of the diamonds is hidden here, on the roundabout. I must stay behind to guard it. However, Zebat is also searching for the diamonds, and if he gets them, he will use them to freeze the sun and wipe out all life. Zebad gets his own minion, Soldier Sam from the Carousel, another new addition that Mr. Davis had been telling us about. <laughs> also, he turns a moose blue, which I believe might actually be a reference to the 1970 film. Anyways, Team Zebedee makes their way to the first diamond, and the movie makes a point to show that Dougal is not really being helpful. Keep up the good work! What's for dinner anyway? I'm famished. Which honestly does kind of fit his characterization from the show. He gets captured by Zebad, and the friends only find him again thanks to the directions of the blue moose from before. Meanwhile, Dougal is able to outwit Zebad's torture in an actually kind of funny and cute way. Look, this is all a bit new to me, so, um, what is it you're most afraid of? Um, hmm. Can't possibly take much more of this. You've eaten 27 sugar cubes. You'll have to make me eat a hundred before I tell you anything. They get Dougal out of the ice castle, but are cornered after, well, another song. <laughs> An epic confrontation occurs between Zebedee and Zebad, but Zebad gets the upper hand and sends Zebedee plunging to his doom. Your days in the sun are over, Zebedee. You benevolent bed spring. Now it's time for Z-Bad. Heartbroken, the team managed to just narrowly escape and resolve to keep pushing to complete their mission. The first major obstacle is a volcanic chasm that they just managed to work around, obtaining the first diamond right when z arrives. They hand over not only the diamond, but also the map, practically without a struggle. However, they manage to discreetly follow behind him to the second diamond. While in the air, Dougal reminisces about times he spent with Florence, giving us a little more gravity to what they're protecting. There's also this scene that has a fun kind of double entendre of Brian and Ermintrude talking about stars. Aren't the stars beautiful? So beautiful. And we also see more of Zebad with his henchmen, and we can see that Soldier Sam isn't really on the same page as his boss. Imagine if you'd waited 10,000 years to come home to your frozen kingdom, only to find a world covered in flowers and animals and sunshine and, and trees and rainbows and tiny little bunny rabbits. Shut up and row! The second diamond is located in a hidden temple riddled with booby traps. And again, a really fun sequence where Brian manages to nonchalantly deactivate all the booby traps just by slithering past them. But just as they're about to get the diamond, Dougal activates the alarm beacons. Oh. 
I actually want to point out that the design of these skeletons is very similar to the one seen in the studio's commercials. That's not even a bad thing. I really like seeing this kind of fingerprint on the movie. As a uh, budding magic roundabout lore expert myself, I can say this scene is the most Bullock's Brothers part of the film so far. It's a lot of fun. Though, maybe not as fun for the characters facing an undead army. Luckily, however, Dylan the Rabbit just so happens to be extremely well-versed in martial arts. And through a combined effort, the gang is able to defeat the skeleton army. But in all the chaos, Z-Bad manages to grab the diamond first. We also get this reference. Resistance is futile! Oh, that's a fun little nod to Star Trek and Doctor Who. Plus, it fits in pretty naturally with the actual context of the scene. Gee, I wonder why I'm specifying that. Anyways, they manage to outwit Zebad using the throne button again, and they resolve that they have to get home in order to defend the third diamond that Zebedee had originally been protecting. On their way back, however, Zebad begins pursuing them using an evil train found in the temple. This will slow Zebad down. Really? Ah! Or it could be an ejector seat. Ah! What the devil was that? What happened? Why am I blind? Did we reach the roundabout yet? So that's where you're headed. Which is admittedly a silly way for Zebat to discover the location of the last diamond. Both trains crash and the friends are stranded in the snow. And as they struggle along, the cold landscape getting to them more and more, the movie gets a little bleak even. Well, that's it, man. It's time for the big sleep. Passed out in the snow, Dougal gets a vision of Florence welcoming him to Sugar Paradise, which he rejects. Luckily, the next morning, they wake up and find they're right near their home. Zebad is already there, but cannot find the diamond on the carousel. Soldier Sam finally gathers the courage to confront him and promptly dies. But it turns out that he actually had the third diamond in his chest the whole time. The heroes walk through town, finding all the houses frozen over, right as Zebad completes his evil scheme. But in the zero hour, they stand resolute and manage to defeat him, returning the diamonds to the roundabout, reversing the evil grip of winter and containing Zebad within once more. Zebedee returns, everyone is okay, and they gleefully clamber onto the roundabout. Except it doesn't go around. Zebedee points out that someone is still missing Sam. And while everyone balks at caring for Zebad's henchmen, Zebedee insists on empathy for the soldier. Don't be too hard on him. Sam, too, was a victim of Zebad's maniacal magic. And I like this. This is a really nice touch. Empathy for something monstrous. Something that could be seen in other work done by Bullock's brothers. Even if Sam wasn't visibly monstrous, he was an antagonist who decided to turn around and stand up for good. So Sam is restored, the magic roundabout begins to work again, and everything's good. You might even say that everything is sweet. I wonder if we can get a song that would convey such an idea. Zebad is shown in a mid credit scene contained within a lake of lava, and the film is over. And honestly, I can't help but be charmed by it. In some ways, sure it shows its age, but the episodic nature of the plot naturally fits the source material, and it succeeds in being the biggest adventure that Dougal and his friends have gone on. All the while, it does still offer a few wings for older fans of the series. Yeah, it starts with some sweets, man. Maybe an iced bun, and before you know it, you're on two bags a day. I know, man, I've been there. I've got something stashed that just might help. Dylan, we don't have time to experiment with recreational activities. All in all, it's an earnest film that has the personal fingerprints of its creative team on it, and it feels like it takes the magic roundabout in a new direction. According to the numbers, the film had a reported budget of $20 million, although Mr. Davis suggested it could have been as high as $30 million. That said, the film only earned about $20 million outside the United States. In the movie business, again these numbers are often hard to find for sure, but the general rule of thumb is that a film needs to gross about twice as much as its production budget to overcome the marketing costs and start earning money. That means it was up to the American release in 2006 to rake in enough cash to get the movie to profit. Considering that the United States was the biggest market for films at the time, it was a feat not too out of reach, as long as the American distributor did not mess things up. 
Butch Hartman is an American cartoonist who's been working in the industry since the 80s. On September 6, 1998, his seven-minute cartoon, The Fairly Odd Parents, aired on the Nickelodeon anthology series Oh Yeah Cartoons. Three years later, it became a full-fledged animated series and ran for 10 seasons. In 2004, Butch got to create a second series called Danny Phantom, which also proved popular enough to see three seasons. More recently, you might know him from Oaxis Entertainment. You know, Oaxis Entertainment, the streaming service that he raised over $268,000 for in 2018. A fundraiser that, at the time of me releasing this video, hasn't seen an update since January 2019. The streaming service explicitly revealed after the fact to be a proponent of the Seven Mountains Mandate, which seeks to impose Christian totalitarianism upon the world in an effort to trigger the biblical end times. You know, Oaxis Entertainment. But I digress. Butch Hartman in 2005 was a beloved cartoonist helping to make Nickelodeon one of the most popular outlets for children's entertainment. That year, he received a call from a Hollywood executive about being involved with a movie. Here was a chance to break into film the same way he had with television. So he accepted a meeting with the producer and was sent a tape of a movie called The Magic Roundabout. Luckily for us, Butch Hartman has been very open about the events surrounding his side of the production. What follows is my recreation of how that meeting went. Butch met with the producer in a hotel room along with his agent. He described the producer with a rough voice, smoking a cigarette. The producer asked, Did you watch the tape? Butch replied that he had. What do you think? Butch replied, And it was a beautiful looking animated film. Like, just imagine a Pixar movie uh, of the Magic Roundabout. And uh, it was one of the most boring movies I'd ever seen. That was a very boring movie. I agree. <sighs> How are we gonna fix it? Now Butch began to offer ideas, but apparently he was repeatedly shot down. Can I edit it? No. I go, okay. And he goes, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I go, can I rewrite it? He goes, no. And I went, well, how am I supposed to fix it? Eventually Butch offered a winning idea. Referencing The Princess Bride, they would film live action scenes that framed the magic roundabout as a story being told to someone else. The producer was also worried that the British parlance of the movie might be off-putting to American audiences. To remedy this, the movie would be dubbed over with American voice actors using a script penned by Butch Hartman himself. Now, this wasn't the craziest idea. Just look at how Eric Thompson's version took off in Britain. Of course, there's a key difference. Serge Dano's French cartoon was quote-unquote translated by Eric Thompson into English. The producer wanted Bullock's Brothers and Action Films' already English movie to be translated into English. Albeit in English that the producer believed more accessible to American audiences. On a completely unrelated note, in 2005, the very British Harry Potter series saw record-breaking sales of the sixth book, and its fourth movie was the second highest grossing title of the year in the United States. I'm just saying. But the mandate was set in place to Americanize the Magic Roundabout. The producer approved the idea, and Butch began putting together a new script. He went bit by bit, watching a few seconds of the original movie, and then writing new lines, trying to keep an eye on the mouth movements in order to still match the animation. Things seemed on track, and... <coughs> yeah, Butch, uh... We're not putting up the money for the live-action segments. It's just gonna be the dubbing script. But still, they pressed on. The most seasoned talent in the industry gathered together, including some of the most acclaimed voice actors they could find, such as Jon Stewart of Batman vs Superman fame, Whoopi Goldberg of the Little Engine That Could fame, and even noted NFT salesman Jimmy Fallon. But among them was also Daniel Tay, who at the time was 14. You would probably recognize Tay best from his role as Buddy the Elf's half-brother from the movie Elf. Tay would be taking over the role of Dougal, uh, sorry, the role of Dougal, because God forbid we use too many U's the side of the Atlantic. But this is a notable change in the character. While Dougal was never old, he had more of a young adult feel to him, someone who was just old enough to be cynical about the world and aloof from it all. The English voice had mirrored that approach. Now that he was going to be voiced by an actual child, that would make him seem more naive. The American advertising campaign ramped up, boasting that the film came to us from the creator of The Fairly Odd Parents. Finally, the big day arrived, and Butch Hartman sat down in the theater to see the fruits of his labors. 
and what he saw horrified him. And uh, they rewrote most of my stuff. They re-recorded it. Re wow. Most of my stuff was rewritten, re-recorded. And so the movie that you see, I had maybe 3% to do with. Honestly, it was taken out of my grasp and uh, Harvey Weinstein kind of ruined my, <laughs> I mean, yeah. the parts. Welcome to ABC News Live. We have breaking news for you. Harvey Weinstein is heading to prison. Judge James Burke in New York City just delivered the sentence. Harvey Weinstein is a convicted sex offender who also managed to get 330 producer credits on the Internet Movie Database. He was not just involved in making movies, though. He was involved in distributing them as well. That is, purchasing the rights to movies that were already finished, usually films made abroad, and getting them into theaters. But... Usually, he made his own little tweaks along the way. I've actually talked a bit about this mindset of his in my Snowpiercer video. For those who don't know, Harvey Weinstein had been unaffectionately nicknamed Edward Scissorhands by filmmakers for his tendency to take films and demand cuts and changes be made to fit his vision. Being as powerful as he was in the industry, he usually got his way. And being as conceited and hubristic as he was, the movies usually suffered for it. So this is the man who in October 2004, purchased the rights to Sprung the Magic Roundabout. And sure enough, when the finished movie arrived at his desk, he wanted to make changes. That's when he approached Butch Hartman. That's when he pulled together a big cast for this project. And that's when things really went south. Butch describes his time working with Harvey as an experience of power play. I said, I can do it any night of the year, I just can't do it November 11th. That's the one night I can't do it. Guess when they scheduled the recording? <laughs> November, 11th. November 11th. After Butch had turned in his finished movie to Harvey, a finished movie which, keep in mind, had already been a finished movie even before Butch took it over, the producer turned around and began to mess with it even more. The script was tossed away again, and Weinstein either made his own or he's an uncredited ghostwriter. The voice cast was reconvened, and well, <laughs> I'll let them speak for themselves. Harvey Weinstein called and said, <laughs> uh, do this film. And I fear him, as most do. And I said, yes, please don't hurt me. Harvey said, you'd make a great snail. And I thought it was code for something, but uh, he said, I'm gonna send you a script. And the script was Dougal. I slimed my shell. So I played Brian the snail. First snail I've ever played, actually. Can you believe that? Jimmy Fallon's ad libs are just hysterical. Yeah, it's just, yeah, just saying as many references as you can. Oops, I just tooted. I've never done voices on uh, for cartoons. I've always wanted to. Oops, sorry, air biscuit. I thought, and my gum came out. Oh, shucks. Uh, I, I want this uh, to be sent to Harvey. I've always wanted to work with Harvey, you know, as he promised many times, uh, me and uh, Bobby De Niro would do something together. Why do I always get the shaft? So uh, now I'm doing a train in a cartoon. Lucky I have tunnel vision. Unfortunately, Mr. De Niro is busy, uh, so I have to work with Whoopi. Ow! Oh, wow! I'm a bad cow I like it, but I, I'm not sure it's uh, something I should be doing, like, in public. I said, no! Nah! Dougal, unsurprisingly, follows largely the same story as the Magic Roundabout. But sure enough, Harvey's editing knife can be acutely felt at various points. For example, the opening scene is cut down. Zebad's head-shaped ice palace does not appear in the American version. Plus, the scene is reshuffled. Notice how the first appearance of Soldier Sam occurs after Zebad escapes now. <laughs> The story makes less sense now. Soldier Sam faltering here implies that one of the three diamonds needed to contain Z-Bad had been dislodged, which enabled his escape. I know at the moment, it sounds like I'm nitpicking a movie described by its own creator as being targeted for six-year-olds, but I think it is fascinating to see what things Weinstein ordered cut from an already finished and released movie. Other stuff is removed or shifted around, generally things that are atmosphere building or character moments. There are other scenes that are also truncated, any quiet moments sucked out in an effort to keep constant sound on the screen, which we'll circle back around to later. This scene of Dougal reminiscing about his hometown is bumped to the end of the movie, which both hurts our understanding of what's at stake during the story, 
and unnecessarily extends the ending. The scene of Dougal having a nightmare is cut from the movie entirely. Overall, things are shunted around and trimmed because apparently, Harvey absolutely needed to shave 8 more minutes off of an impossibly long 85 minute movie. Meanwhile, a lot of stuff is added. Like narration. And here, they all are together. And together is what this story is all about. Real quick, I'm going to let you listen to that line once more. Together is what this story is all about. Again, it feels like the movie is afraid we're going to look away if there's not constant talking or noise on the screen. And I mean constant talking or noise. Cartoon sound effects are added in with a delicate touch of a shotgun. <laughs> The moose is upgraded to a speaking role. Two words, sir. Personal hygiene. Oh, and he farts now. The talking role now renders this line confusing. Who ever heard of a talking moose? Huh? Which, I guess the moose isn't actually talking. We, the audience, just perceive him talking? Maybe that's what's going on. Perhaps I should give it the benefit of the doubt. I mean, let's not forget whose very capable hands we're in, after all. The jungle temple has been turned into a mall. Ah, here we go. Men's room, food court, ha! Booby-trapped lobby. And again, the story is changed here. In the magic roundabout, the gang knows all along that the final diamond is in the carousel. However, in Dougal, they are not told this. As a result, they don't have the motivation to go home after confronting z at the jungle temple. <clears throat> uh, sorry, the mall. So instead, a still image is inserted here, with hieroglyphics portraying the diamond inside the carousel. This isn't exactly a detrimental change, I would say, but it doesn't really add anything. So, again, why did Harvey go to the trouble of changing it? Now, interestingly, there's a moment where a pop song was actually removed. Capital idea! <laughs> I don't know, but I've been told we're gonna make the world real cold. And there's also this new music composed for the climax, instead of using Also Sprock Zaratustra. So one reference was removed, but oh boy, oh do they make up for it. I've selected a handful, only a handful, of the most flagrant ones here. Oh right, on the Blue Man Group's back in town. You know there can only be one spring to rule them all, and I am the Lord of the Springs. I got a set of tools. Anyone seen Pimp My Boat? We can't do that, sir! Geneva Convention, sir! I don't care if it's a Star Trek convention! <laughs> Trekkies! Nerd alert! <laughs> Beam him out! But this... comedy reaches its zenith in the temple scene. I praise the British version of the scene for being a moment where Bullock's brothers could step into what they do best, giving it a little bit of a scarier edge, even if it has to be held back for the family audience. The wine scene cut turns us into one of the worst scenes I've ever witnessed in a movie. Half of this movie's pop culture references are shoved into about seven minutes of agony. Here's Johnny. Someone order ribs. Bring out your dead! Pirates of the Caribbean. Hey, I thought we said no Disney jokes. Contrasting the two sequences, it's really day and night difference. Sorry, I don't believe in violence. Oh! Oh! Except in self-defense. My name is Neo. Hey, I'm Steve. <laughs> there is no spoon. That doesn't even make any sense. That's the opposite of how you make reference humor work. And it only gets worse from there. Look at all Dawn of the Dead and everything. I train with Morpheus. I know Kung Fu, John Woo, Judo, Kendo, Taekwondo, Wu-Tang Clan. Hammer time! <laughs> ah, you know you can't touch this. Wax on, wax off! Uh, just a couple of muggles on a way to Hogwarts here for a pickup from he who must not be named. Someone's been watching CSI. Now, Coming, I'd sir. like to thank the Academy. I'll take familiar over the Temple of Doom any day. All of this to say, when it comes to judging this Liberty voice cast, they didn't have anything to work with here. As for Daniel Tay, again, he's a kid, nothing I'm about to say is his fault, but he was completely miscast. The best child actor wouldn't have been able to change the fact that Dougal as a character does not work with a kid's voice. Dougal is supposed to be a little bit of a jerk, but he's a funny jerk who ultimately will do the right thing. 
His playful arrogance only works if it ends up being the butt of a joke, and it often is. Oh dear, I'll never be promoted now. Still a lance corporal. Huh, how humiliating. Dougal was written and therefore animated with this personality in mind. As a result, giving him the voice of a kid and writing him to be a wide-eyed innocent character is doomed to fail. It's visually hard-coded into the finished product that he causes problems for others. But rather than it being a comeuppance for him being self-centered, it just makes Dougal look stupid. And a stupid main character makes for a very frustrating viewing experience for the audience. Again, Nothing Daniel Tay could have done would have fixed this. So, in summary, Weinstein's version messes with the narrative flow of the film, it adds a new layer of obnoxious sound design, it adds another new layer of obnoxious dubbed humor, and it completely guts the core of the titular character. This is the movie that Harvey thought the American audience deserved. This isn't dumbing down, this is a full scale lobotomy. 85 minutes you'll never get back. The only positive thing that might come out of Dougal is a litany of self-deprecating jokes Jon Stewart will undoubtedly tell when he hosts the Oscars. Dougal is an exceedingly lame animated feature about a bunch of kids trapped on a magical carousel, but it's adults forced to sit through the slow-moving G-rated Lord of the Rings knockoff who will be begging for mercy. In case you can't tell, the Weinstein cut was not well received. Dougal managed to achieve a remarkable feat of getting a single-digit score in Rotten Tomatoes. But you know, it's alright. As long as audiences took to it, then it would be just fine it opened 8th in the box office. After only two weeks, over 60% of the cinemas it opened in had dropped the title. And when it finally left theaters, it had made only $7.5 million nationally, bringing the global gross to a meager $28 million. Sprung the Magic Roundabout, was officially a box office flop. Butch Hartman disavowed the movie. By the way, I want to, uh, first of all, apologize for Dougal. Uh, yeah. Harvey Weinstein would fail to learn any lesson from it whatsoever. But notably, this isn't where the story ended for this new generation of The Magic Roundabout. Action Synthes would go on to produce over 111-minute episodes of The Magic Roundabout using computer animation up through 2009. But since then... There's been nothing. So, where are they now? Harvey Weinstein has managed to win a retrial for his New York conviction, but thanks to California, is still in prison. And God willing, he will stay there. Butch Hartman now runs his own YouTube channel, and is working very, very, very hard on Oaxis Entertainment, I am sure. Jean Duval continues to work in animation in Paris, France as a director. Frank Passingham served as director of photography on projects like Pirates Band of Misfits, Kubo and the Two Strings, and 2022's Pinocchio, The Good One. The Sunusi brothers are attempting to produce their own feature film called Droidland, which has seen some test footage shot, and just recently they made their debut on YouTube painting models. The Magic Roundabout is making a comeback. In 2022, a reboot was announced with a new studio, and it's due out this year. And David Borthwick... Well, Dave and I actually had a project that we developed for a couple of years and ended up going to Hollywood and doing the whole thing of spending a week in Hollywood, going around the studios, pitching it. And it was about, it was a sci-fi uh, film called Cluster World. If, if only Dave hadn't died, he came ill and died. He was too young. Borthwick passed away in 2012, survived by three children, two grandchildren, and a sister. In my discussions with Paul Davis and Andy Layton, they describe a man who is passionate, a man who had vision, a man fondly remembered by those around him. His earliest work took literal trash, brought it alive, and from there his strengths only grew. Even his commercial projects were so clearly stamped with his personal style. At the height of his powers, David Borthwick invited us into strange, surreal worlds unlike anything we'd ever seen, encouraging us to find humanity even in twisted places. David Borthwick pushed the medium forward, he mentored great minds in the field, and his efforts can be seen in the continued presence of stop-motion animation today. David Borthwick was an artist, and he loved making art.
I think the philosophy of Brothers Brothers is that ideas really need a playground and you've got to create an environment in which those ideas want to come and play and I mean that's the same with any creative process. I think when you're making films, you know, you, well for me, I'm making it because I want to make it, not because I want people to see it. I honestly couldn't give a toss whether anybody saw what I make, you know, it doesn't bother me, you know, what's important to me is what I learn while I'm making it and that's, if somebody wants to look at that afterwards and find that interesting to watch and that's great. Believe it or not, this was supposed to be a short video, but with all that I found, more than I ever thought I would find when I started researching Dougal of all movies, how do I put it together? What do you want people to take away from your story here? Um, try to do the right thing. Follow your heart, follow your instincts. They're usually right. Uh, easy to say, hard to do. Easier to be wise in retrospect. I started researching this movie because I knew the story about Weinstein and Butch Hartman. I knew the cynical side of the story, the ugly side, and thought it would make good content. But as I dug deeper and deeper and spoke with Paul and Andy, I found myself fascinated more with their side of the story. Their honesty and frankness were of course appreciated, and yet I was struck even more by the way they spoke so fondly of the work, the way they described the supportive community in Bristol, and the brilliant minds they worked with. And I found myself moved, more than I ever thought I would be during this project. Creating art is hard. And that's true when you're creating something as small scale and personal as a single book, a painting on a canvas, or a little stop-motion film in your apartment. When you start working on something more complex like, say, a theatrical production, that complexity is compounded. People will each have their own visions for what the finished product will be. And then when you start talking about films, you have to take into account the specialized equipment that needs to be obtained, the technical prowess required to work it, and it seems remarkable that any movies manage to be made. Sometimes, it doesn't come together. Visions focused on numbers and ancillaries and focus group testing take over and subordinate the creative process. In such an environment, all that matters is the money, the titles, and by extension, the power. And to obtain that power, the product becomes an Ouroboros of market-tested safety. Stories are referred to as IP, and the safest investment in the market of IP are surefire hits like Jimmy Fallon saying his name is Neo. It's a mindset that isn't interested in any legacy beyond the current financial quarter. But sometimes, the stars align. Visions harmonize, creating something that becomes more than the sum of its parts. An artwork that can express ideas and emotions that resonate with the hearts of thousands around the world, if not millions. The two men I spoke to for this project, and the third man I'll never have a chance to speak with, come across as nothing less than passionate artists. They have dedicated their lives to the stage, to the screen, to the written word, and more. They persevered through hardship and tribulation, through ups and downs, and even when something didn't work, they just picked up, kept going, kept creating, and they never lost the positivity. But you have to have faith. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist, and you have to have faith that uh, uh, justice will be done. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. What do I see then when I look at this movie? I see the face of Dougal and remember a man who, with his bed rest, built a cultural phenomenon in the kitchen of his French apartment. I see the animation on the back and consider the legacy of an unsung genius breaking into the mainstream. I see both sides of cinema, the creative and the corporate, married here in all their glory and monstrosity. I see a saga that spans from the most authentic desire of expression to the most cynical executive meddling. In this little DVD I bought for $7.99 off Amazon, I see both everything terrible and everything beautiful about making art. Now let me ask again, what do you see? Dougal was waiting for Brian. Oh, 
Come on, lightning. Hello. There's no time for pleasantries, said Dougal. You are late. We've got a lot to do and you're late. If you were in a union, I'd sack you. Now pull yourself together and concentrate on the working hand. Really, you're pathetic. I'm going home. Oh, dear. Now I've hurt his feelings. Oh, come back. I apologise. Humbly? Yes, humbly. Then I shall return, said Brian. Well, I'm glad we've sorted that out, said Dougal. And he and Brian got down to the work in hand, making a film. Brian was the camera carrier. Now hold it steady, said Dougal. Freeze. Brian froze, and Dougal went to look for his star actress. She arrived. Hello, Dougal, said Florence. Oh, I'm so excited. Me, a film star. Hello, Brian. I am a camera, said Brian. Now, are we all ready, said Dougal. We must get started. Aye, aye, Antonio, oni, 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 said Brian. This is going to be the greatest picture ever made said Dougal, modestly. This will make Ben-Hur look like an advertisement for Turkish delight. This will make Ken Russell spit with jealousy. Take one. And Dougal started to make his epic film. He consulted his script. He chose the best locations. What was it to be? Treasure Island in Dougal vision. Florence acted her first scene, and Dylan arrived. I hear you're making a film, he said. I am trying to, said Dougal patiently, but you've just walked in and ruined the first scene. Uh, well, uh, I don't want to worry you, said Dylan, but uh, look. Indians? I didn't order Indians? Come out. Said Florence. Wasn't I good? said Ermintrude, appearing. Oh, joy, joy! I'm a film star! A film star! Dougal sighed. I wonder if this ever happened to Eisenstein, he thought. Let's get on then, said Brian. Right, said Dougal. Underwater, close up of shark. What? shrieked Brian. Come back, you coward! I'm a film star, film star. Camera, shouted Dougal. I'm not filming no sharks, said Brian. Oh, all right, said Dougal. We'll have some man-eating butterflies instead. Really, really? Hello, where's my leading lady? I'm here, shouted Florence, and I found the treasure. How exciting, breathed Florence. Captain Cook's treasure. Now, now, wait a minute, said Dougal. Wait a minute. What's the use of doing the treasure scene without the camera? Really? Why does everyone have to be so stupid? Knew that would happen, said Florence. I knew that would happen, said Dougal. What's in there, Dougal, said Florence. Treasure, said Dougal. It was a large lump of sugar, and I'll trouble you all to keep your thieving hands off it. <laughs> Zebedee arrived. Any room in your film for a little one? he asked. I've gone off the whole idea, said Dougal. I think I'll go to the pictures instead. 